Thank you so much, Duncan, for that really kind introduction. It is lovely to be back here and to have a, an absolutely packed room full of people. Um, yeah, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the second book that I've written, um, which is called How to Expect the Unexpected. Um, and there are two main phenomena that I want to draw to people's attention. Maybe you'll be familiar with some of these ideas, maybe you won't. But I hope that some, some of the stories at least will be entertaining throughout the talk. So the two main phenomena that I think that can confound us in our everyday lives that we maybe don't allow for are non-linearity and randomness. So I'm going to start by talking about non-linearity and I've said the word twice now already and I haven't yet told you what non-linearity actually means. But in order to tell you what non-linearity means, I first have to talk a little bit about what linearity means. So what is linearity? It may be a familiar concept for many people, but maybe not for others. So here's an example for, uh, for an exchange rate. I'm changing pounds into New Zealand dollars. And the idea of a linear relationship is that a fixed change in the input should give me a fixed change in the output. And when I draw that on a graph, it turns up as a straight line, hence the name linear, right? So um, if I want to change 20 pounds into dollars, the exchange rate is roughly two to one for New Zealand dollars, so I should get $40. If I increase the amount I want to change by a fixed amount, by 20 pounds, then I should increase the amount I get back by a fixed amount, by $40. So I get $80 for 40 pounds. Again, if I increase by a fixed amount, the input, by another 20 pounds, then I increase the output I get by the same amount to get another $40, so to get a total of $120. Okay, so it's a relatively straightforward idea, but the idea is that it doesn't matter where you start, a fixed change in the input should always give you a fixed change in the output. And this particular relationship between pounds and dollars with the exchange rate is a special type of linear relationship and it's called direct proportion. Okay, so that means that if I double the input, I should also double the output. So if I change 40 pounds instead of changing 20 pounds, I should get $40 back instead of getting $80 back. Okay, so I've labored the point, I'm gonna carry on laboring it. Not all linear relationships are in direct proportion. So, for example, we have two temperature scales in the world, and when I say in the world, I mean everyone in the world uses Celsius except for America, who uses Fahrenheit, okay? <laughs> and if you want to convert between those two, then it's a linear relationship because every degree Celsius is worth 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So if I have a fixed change in the degrees Celsius, then I have a fixed change in the degrees Fahrenheit. So here's the graph. Again, it comes out as a straight line. That's the essence of a linear relationship. If it's 10 degrees Celsius, then the actual formula is times by 1.8 and add 32. Uh, it's weird because it, the Fahrenheit temperature scale is based on boiling points of brine and weird things like that, whereas the Celsius one is about freezing and boiling points of water, which makes a bit more sense. Anyway, the conversion is times 1.8 and add 32. So for 10 degrees Celsius, it's 50 degrees Fahrenheit. If I increase the degree Celsius by 10 degrees, then I get an increase of 18 degrees in the Fahrenheit temperature to 50, uh, sorry, to 68. And then if I increase it again by another 10 degrees, then I get another 18 degree increase. A fixed change in the input always gives me a fixed change in the output, no matter where I am. But for this relationship, it's not direct proportion because if I double the temperature from 10 to 20 Celsius, I don't double the Fahrenheit temperature from 50 to 100 Celsius. Okay, so I have massively overlabored what a linear relationship is. Okay, I'm sure that everyone will have known this before I even started, but anyway, but this is partly the point actually, because we are so familiar with linear relationships that we never, or we often don't stop to, to step back and think what happens if the relationship between these two variables is not linear. And the reason we're so familiar with these linear relationships is partly because at school it gets drilled into us that this is the way you answer a problem. So here's a classic problem that you get at school. If Jane pays five pounds for 10 grapefruits, how many grapefruits does she get for 50 pounds? Does anyone feel brave and want to answer this linear question? 100, yeah, exactly. So um, you pay 10 times as much and you should get 10 times as many grapefruits. You get 100 grapefruit, but no one steps back and stops to say, what the hell is Jane doing with 100 grapefruits? Who's got 100 grapefruits to sell, right? What is, what's going on? This isn't a real world problem. And even if it was, you would go to a wholesaler and you would get a discount for buying more grapefruits, right? So it really shouldn't be a linear relationship, but this is the sort of question we train our kids upon to get them to understand linear relationships. And it just becomes second nature to us. 
And so to try to understand how ingrained this bias is in the way that we think, psychologists ask people what are called pseudo-linearity questions. So they come up with things like, OK, Laura is a sprinter. Her best time to run 100 metres is 13 seconds. How long does it take Laura to run a kilometre? And of course, the answer is, well, the kilometre is 10 times as long as 100 metres, so it should take her 10 times as long. It should take her 130 seconds to run a kilometre. That's the <coughs> linear answer. But this guy would probably argue with that. This guy is called Noah Ngeni. He is the world record holder for the kilometre. His best time to do a kilometre is 2 minutes and 11 seconds. So by arguing that Laura can do a kilometre in 2 minutes and 10 seconds, we're forgetting, of course, that no one can sustain their best 100 metre pace over the course of a whole kilometre. We're arguing linearly, but actually we shouldn't be. We should be thinking that actually this is a non-linear relationship. The, the distance that you cover doesn't scale linearly with the time that you can cover your 100 metres. OK, so that's a type of uh, pseudo-linearity question. Here's another one. Um, that I actually asked to chat GPT. So it takes three <laughs> towels three hours to dry on the line. How long does it take nine towels to dry? What do we think chat GPT said? Well, here's the answer. Chat GPT said, if it takes three hours for three towels to dry, then it would take nine hours for nine towels to dry. And this is because the drying time is directly proportional, that important linear relationship that we met before. If you double the number of towels, you double the drying time. If you triple the number of towels, you triple the drying time. And of course, if your line is long enough, then it doesn't matter how many towels you're drying. It should still take the same time to dry three towels as it takes to dry nine towels. Now, I gave this talk three or four months ago at the Royal Institution or something similar to this, and, uh, and they clipped up that last minute that I've just done, and it went, it went quite viral. It did about 10 million views on their YouTube channel. It's the biggest video that they've done. Um, and something changed at ChatGPT. So um, <laughs> now when you ask ChatGPT, <laughs> Uh, it says, this is a tricky question. The number of towels shouldn't affect the drying time um, if all other variables like weather conditions, humidity are constant. So because they've updated that, I thought, let's go instead to Bard, right? Because I'm coming to Google. Let's see if Bard is, is, has got this right. And thankfully, Bard hasn't got this down. So it's a bit small, but it says, Bard says, if it takes three towels, three hours to dry on the line, then it takes one hour for one towel to dry. Mm. Uh, so it would take nine hours for nine towels to dry. So thank you, Bard. I mean, this is, I mean, not, not deliberately coming to troll Google, but this is, uh, I thought this was quite fun. Um, but actually, what is the expected behavior, right? These chatbots are potentially trying to imitate real human behavior. And I think if you asked a lot of humans, they would probably say, well, it, you know, it takes nine hours for nine tiles to dry using this linear reasoning that's so ingrained with this. So maybe Bard is doing better than ChatGPT on that. Um, here's another pseudo-linearity problem, which maybe you can answer in a more mathematical way. So Farmer Jones takes one hour to mow a square field which has sides of length 100 meters. How long would it take her to mow a square field of length 300 meters? And so the linear answer is, well, the, the field is three times as long, and so it should take three times as long, it should take three hours. But of course, with a field, when you're trying to mow the field, what's important is not the length of one side of the field, but it's the area of the field, right? And with a square field, if I make one side length three times as long, I also make the other side length three times as long. And the area gets bigger by a factor of not three, but three times three, nine. Okay, so actually, it should take Farmer Jones nine hours to mow this field. So where does this sort of reasoning come uh, in, in the real world? Well, it comes in when we're thinking about pizza, okay, and the value for money for pizza. So I'm going to posit that the, the price of a pizza scales linearly with the diameter. And this is true, and I'll show you some data to back that up in a second. But then I'm going to ask you a question. So if you want to maximize your value for money, is it better to order two 8-inch pizzas for £10 each, or one 16-inch diameter pizza for £20? And so the linear argument goes like this. If I buy two 8-inch pizzas, that's 16 inches in diameter in total, and that costs me £20. And one 16-inch diameter pizza costs me £20. So the linear reasoning says it doesn't matter. But of course, what we care about when we're eating pizza is not the total diameter of pizzas when they're stacked back to back. It's the area of the pizza, right? So this is your 16-inch diameter pizza, and this is your two 8-inch diameter pizzas, right? So you can see that you actually only get half the pizza with the two 8-inch diameters. If you wanted to get the same area of pizza, you would need four of those 8-inch diameter pizzas, which would cost you £40, not £20, 
for the 16th diameter pizza. So the fact that there's this nonlinear relationship that the area scales as the square of the diameter, while the price scales linearly with the diameter, means you get better value for money with your pizzas the bigger the pizza that you buy. Just to double check that it is true that the price of the pizza scales linearly with the diameter, um, this is data that was collected by a New York Times journalist, a guy called Quattrung Boy. He went out to three and a half thousand pizza parlors. I don't think he actually went to each one. He probably did a data scrape or something like that. But he found the prices of 75,000 pizzas and he plotted them on a chart which looks like this. And you can see that roughly the, the diameter of the pizza does scale linearly with the price. But remember that the area scales as the square of the diameter. So the more you pay for the pizza, or the bigger the pizza you get, the better value for money you get. So the take home message, and this isn't the main message of the book, but there is a message here, uh, is that if you're buying pizza, you should get the biggest pizza that you can get, which meets the needs of the people who are eating the pizza. Right, so pizza is important. Other places where positive feedback loop, or where non-linear relationships come up are in, in positive feedback loops. So a positive feedback loop is when something um, increases its own quantity. So for example, you get acoustic feedback. So artists like Jimi Hendrix and the Grateful Dead, their music is almost synonymous with acoustic feedback. And acoustic feedback happens when, usually when your mic is too close to the amp, the mic picks up a sound, it sends it to the amp, the amp then increases the volume, it amplifies it, that's the, the name of the, the piece of machinery. The mic picks it up again and then it sends it back to the amp and you get this feedback loop where the volume increases and particularly you get certain frequencies. It's usually high screechy frequencies we associate acoustic feedback with but sometimes you can get it with low frequencies. It depends on the machinery that you're working with. So that's an example of a feedback loop. Another example of a feedback loop is when you have a rock slide. So it might start, it often happens in the rainy season in India, for example, in, in, in mountainous regions of India. Um, you get rain coming down and that maybe dislodges a, a bit of grit or dirt, which then hits a pebble and then the pebble can hit a rock and a rock can hit a stone and a stone hits a bigger stone, which hits a boulder, which hits a bigger boulder. And all of a sudden there are tens of tons of rock falling down the mountain and basically destroying everything in its wake. So again, here the quantity is the amount of material coming down the mountainside and the more there is the more that that increases its own rate of growth the more the material comes down the mountainside another place where you see positive feedback loops is in the stock market so if a company is doing well its stock price might rise in the stock market and then people pay attention to that and they say hmm, I'm gonna get in I'm gonna buy some of that stock and so actually the supply is outstripped uh, sorry is uh, outstripped by the demand people want to buy this so people who are selling it can afford to uh, ask more for that stock price, so the price goes up. And then more people say, oh, this company's doing really well, I'm going to buy these. And so the demand increases and increases, and people selling can ask for more and more, and the price goes up, until often, sometimes, the, uh, the price becomes totally divorced from the actual quality of that company. And this is what we saw, for example, in the dot-com boom in the late 90s and early noughties, where companies that had never even posted a profit, profit were doing incredibly well, had huge soaring stock prices, despite the fact there was not really much there to back up what those companies were doing. And so the, the stock price increased and decoupled from the actual quality of the company. And then, of course, in, in the markets, bubbles like the, the dot-com bubble, they can burst, right? So um, what goes up must or can at least come down. Uh, and so interestingly, with the three examples of positive feedback loops I've, done, I've told you about so far, the quantity that uh, is subject to the feedback loop is increasing. And that seems natural because the word positive and positive feedback loop. But actually positive feedback loops can lead to things decreasing as well. So again, take the, take the stock market for example. If a company um, isn't doing so well and its stock price dips a little bit, then people might want to sell that stock. So that time the supply is outstripping the demand. So people, it's a buyer's market and the buyers can say, well, I'm not going to pay that for it, I can get it cheaper from someone else. So the price goes down and when the price goes down more people want to sell that stock and the, the price itself feeds into this feedback loop and you can get the quantity decreasing which is why people tell you that the price of your investment may get up as well as down according to positive feedback loops so it's not always a uh, positive feedback loop is not always associated with an increasing quantity but it's a quantity which changes its own size Another place where we're particularly worried about positive feedback loops is in global warming. Okay, so in particular in anthropogenic global warming. There are a number of uh, different feedback loops that feed into the, the, the temperature of our planet. One of the most important ones is called the ice albedo feedback. So um, the albedo is the amount of heat energy that is incident on the Earth from the sun, which gets reflected back into the atmosphere. 
Um, typically, white surfaces like snow and ice, they reflect more heat energy. Dark surfaces like the land and the sea, they reflect less of the heat energy. So what can happen is if we get even a, a sort of small change in temperature caused by us on the Earth, which melts some ice and snow, that means that there's more dark area exposed and less white area, so we absorb more of the heat energy into the Earth, which then increases the temperature. It melts more of the snow and ice, and that reduces the albedo further, we absorb more heat energy. And so this is why this feedback loop is why climate scientists are so concerned about what seem like relatively small changes in temperature to us, because there are the potential for these non-linear phenomena, these feedback loops to kick in and to take things somewhat out of our control. Again, with climate change, it's interesting that the temperature through this ice albedo feedback loop doesn't always have to go up. So there's a hypothesis called the snowball earth hypothesis that suggests that tens of thousands of years ago, the whole earth was just a giant ball of snow and ice. And it was the same feedback loop just operating in reverse. The, the global temperature decreased a bit, which meant that there was more snow and ice that reflected more of the sun's heat energy back and absorbed less of it. So the temperature dropped more, that made more snow and ice. And eventually the earth became almost entirely covered in snow and, and ice. Um, so it's doubly fitting this name, this snowball earth hypothesis, both because the earth looked like a giant snowball, but also because sometimes for these positive feedback loops, we give them the name the snowball effect when a bit of snow rolls down the mountain and, and grows uncontrollably. And that's what's happening in this feedback loop. Perhaps one of the most important places where we see positive feedback loops there is somewhere that you will all know and have experienced acutely in the last three or four years. You've guessed it, I'm talking about the pandemic. So epidemics, at the start of an epidemic, the number of infected people causes itself to grow because people pass on the disease to each other. And so typically at the start of an epidemic, we're subject to a positive feedback loop. Um, I don't know if you remember the, the first strain that came out of, of, uh, of China that came over to Europe, the first strain of COVID, there have been multiple strains since then. Um, it had what's called a reproduction number of three. So just, uh, people maybe remember the R number, maybe you're all familiar with it. But the, the basic reproduction number tells you in a completely susceptible population how many people each infectious individual will infect during the course of their infectious period. So for the original SARS-CoV-2 virus, that uh, was about three. So each person was infecting three other people. And so what happens when that happens, when everyone is susceptible, is that the first person can then infect three other people. They go on to infect three other people each. And you can see how this spirals out of control very quickly. This is a very specific example of a positive feedback loop, which many people will be familiar with. It's called exponential growth. OK, so exponential growth has multiple meanings in different contexts. In the media, it's often used to mean fast or or, or to mean big, something that's big or growing quickly. But actually, that's not the technical definition of exponential growth. Exponential growth is something which grows in proportion to its current size, right? So the money in your bank account, if you leave it there long enough, it is growing exponentially. You're getting interest and your interest is getting interest. You're getting compound interest. And so the money is growing in proportion to its current size. But I don't think anyone would accuse the money of their bank account, or certainly not in my bank account, of being big or fast. Okay, It's not fast growing. It doesn't seem very big in my bank account anyway. So, um, so it is an exponential growth process, but it's not big or fast. And that, that can surprise people, I think. And this is what exponential curves can look like sometimes. They can look like they're growing very slowly and linearly almost at the start. And then very quickly they can take off. Um, and get out of control. And this is why we sometimes call an exponential growth called curve a J-shaped curve, because they have this very, very, uh, this propensity to take off very, very quickly. Now, um, this is troublesome for a number of reasons, because partly because we're so ingrained with this idea of linearity, that even with processes which are growing exponentially, we think, oh, it's just going to continue to grow as it is. This is called linearity bias. We're going we're to assume that something is changing in the same rate or maybe just constant over time. And actually, very quickly, it can get out of hand. So there's something, a phenomenon called exponential growth bias. Uh, and I like to visualize it in my head at least like this. It's really simple visualization. So you've got time on the x-axis, and you've got the size of whatever quantity it is on the y-axis. And in our, in our heads, we're, if we're subject to exponential growth bias, we think that quantity is going to grow like the dashed line. It's just going to grow linearly, continuing to change at the same slow rate as it currently is. And actually what's happening is the full black curve here where it's just it's going to, to take off and it's going to grow exponentially and get much bigger than we think. So exponential growth bias has a number of problems. It means that people who suffer from this bias don't tend to invest for the future. 
because they tend to undervalue the value of their savings in the future because they don't appreciate that it's going to grow exponentially and they think it's just going to grow linearly. The flip side of that is that they also take on more debt than they should do because they undervalue the value that that debt is going to cost them to service in the future because your debt is also growing exponentially. Okay, if you don't pay off your debt, then you get interest accrues on the interest that you owe. So it's been shown through a number of studies that people who exhibit higher levels of exponential growth bias also have higher debt to income ratios. They have more debt compared to their income, so it controls somewhat for educational attainment there. Um, the other thing about exponential growth bias, going back to the pandemic, is that people who exhibit high levels of exponential growth bias were also less likely to uh, comply with non-pharmaceutical interventions, things like mask wearing, social distancing, test taking, contact tracing, things which were designed to slow the spread of the pandemic. And the thinking is that people just couldn't appreciate how quickly this thing was going to take off. Right? People were seeing numbers of cases in, in the tens or hundreds and thinking, well, this is a country of 60 million people, so that, that seems relatively small. But then very quickly, as we saw both in the first wave and indeed in the second wave, things can get out of hand if you don't take action. So exponential growth, go, sorry, exponential growth bias can, um, can damage our responses to, to things like pandemics. Um, so that's the end of the first bit of the talk about non-linearity. And the, the main take-home messages that I want to just remind you of are we are all predisposed, some to more, some to less degree, to expect linear relationships. But many of the most important phenomena that we experience day to day are not linear. Many of these phenomena are subject to all sorts of nonlinear behaviours, and I haven't talked about them all, there's lots more in the book, but things like exponential growth, square laws, there's cube laws, there are feedback loops, both positive, which give us these um, you know, growth processes which grow unexpectedly quickly, like exponential growth, but also negative feedback loops, processes which inhibit the quantity that's growing, which can lead us to things like uh, self-defeating prophecies, where we make a prophecy which actually defeats itself. And some of the models that were around at the start of the pandemic, predicting hundreds of thousands of deaths, themselves were self-defeating prophecies because once those predictions were made, people acted on those predictions to make sure that those deaths didn't occur. So there are all sorts of interesting non-linear phenomena that which we can, we can come across in everyday life. Uh, and I suppose uh, part of the argument of the book is to, um, is to make people aware of those, those different phenomena so we can start to expect them in different circumstances. The second thing that I think confounds us when we come to thinking about everyday life is randomness or uncertainty, or you might call it probability. I'm going to call it randomness for the sake of this talk. Um, so with, I, I want to do a little experiment with you. Just I hope people are feeling brave enough to put their hands up. You don't have to. I'm not going to, I'm not going to force anyone to do this. I've got three patterns here. One of them is generated using random numbers. And so by that, I mean uh, I've taken... Uh, for the, the, all of them have got the same number of points, there's about 200 points in each, in each figure. Uh, but for one of them, I've generated the points randomly by choosing an x-coordinate with equal probability from anywhere along the x-axis, from left to right, and choosing a y-coordinate for that point with equal probability at random from anywhere along the vertical axis, so anywhere from the top to the bottom. And I've done that 200 times to generate 200 different points. So I've got three options here, and I'd like to see by just a show of hands, if you're feeling brave enough, which option you think is the one that I generated uh, using truly random numbers. So does anyone fancy going for A? Question. Oh, sorry, question. Yes, go uh, for it. The coordinates are integers or are No, just, just uh, imagine that the axis goes from uh, 0 to 1, and I've just chosen uh, continuously valued random variables uniformly distributed uh, across that. Yeah, good question. So let's go for A. Who fancies A? So maybe a third of people? What about B? Maybe in slightly less than a third. And C, anyone fancy C? Several people going for C, probably about the same as, as B. So probably A was just about the favourite there, and B and C roughly equal. So let me tell you what each one of these patterns is. I'll go backwards. So C is actually the nesting sites of Patagonian seabirds. Um, why did I choose this one? Well, these Patagonian seabirds are very territorial. When they lay their eggs, they want to be spaced out from each other. They don't want to be too near to each other. But they all like to be in the same sort of geographical location because it's good for raising their chicks, it's nice and safe. But they don't want to be too near each other. So actually, um, these birds, they tend to be really well spaced out. And actually, if you look at the pattern, it looks almost 
grid-like. You can sort of see the uh, hexagonal or triangular lattice in there. So that was, that was C. B is actually the nest sites of ants in a field. So these ants are also a bit territorial. They don't like to be too close to each other, but they don't have the same overarching control vision that the seabirds have. So sometimes they end up putting their nests closer together than they might like. So it's a little bit more scattered. It's less than, uh, it's not as grid-like, if you like. But still, uh, this, is, uh, this is the ants in the field. And so A is actually the one that I generated, generated with these genuinely uniformly distributed random numbers to generate these points. Now, um, if you went for B, which was quite a popular option, um, I'm going to talk about, about this random pattern again in a second, but if you went for B, there might be a reason for that, and that's something called middle bias. So when we genuinely don't know the answer to a question, we have a propensity to choose the middlemost option. And this is a real phenomenon. Uh, it happens in SAT tests in America, standardised assessment tests. When students don't know the answer to a multiple choice question, they guess B and C in preference to C and D. For some reason, the middle two options seem more likely than the outer options. It happens in Battleship. If anyone ever played this game, you've got a grid and you have to place some ships on the grid and your neighbour also has a grid and you can't see it. They also have ships on the grid and um, you have to uh, guess to try to bomb their ships, you have to guess a coordinate and try and hit their ships and sink them all by guessing the coordinates. So that's what the red, the red crosses are here, these are the ships. Um, and actually in Battleship we have a propensity to guess the middle coordinates in preference to the edge coordinates. Now that's sort of obvious because there are fewer edge coordinates than there are middle coordinates, but even accounting for that fact that there are more middle coordinates, we still guess disproportionately towards the middle and away from the edge. But we also use it apparently uh, in choosing a toilet cubicle. Um, so apparently the middlemost stalls are more popular. And I used to tell this story and say, you know, don't ask me how they found this out. And, you know, someone wasn't in there watching, I guess. Anyway, I went back and actually read the scientific paper and they did something really clever actually. They didn't put a video in there or anything, that would have been weird and illegal. Um, actually what they did was they asked the janitor who was refilling the toilet toilet rolls, how often do you refill the toilet rolls in each of these cubicles? And it turns out that the middle ones were refilled more often, which I think is a really clever way of using the toilet roll usage as a proxy for how often these stalls were visited. Uh, it's certainly the less creepy option of the two that I presented. So we exhibit this middle bias. So if you went for B because you genuinely didn't know which one it was, it might have been because you had this middle bias. But we've got to be aware of this middle bias. Often when you're going online and you're, you're buying and choosing from multiple options, maybe you're choosing insurance or something like that, um, you're presented with these two options, the basic package and the standard package. And so most of us, when presented with these two options, would compare what's in the list and say, well, actually, the basic package isn't offering me much less than the standard. The standard is $180 more, and it's not giving me much more than the basic package. So I'll probably go for the basic package. But of course, we're never presented with just these two options, are we? We're always presented with these three options, the deluxe option, which is way, 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 way more expensive, which you'll never actually, no one's ever going to choose the deluxe option. It's just there to make the standard option look better. So now you think, well, you know, I can't go with the deluxe option. I'm not like a super fly like that. But I'm not going to go for the basic option. I'm not a cheapskate, right? So I'm going to go for the, the standard option. That's me. I'm standard. I'm going to go for the standard option. And so you end up bumping up the price just because they added on that extra option. So there's this element of choosing the middlemost option, this middle bias that we all suffer from. So bear that in mind for, for what comes next. But I want to talk a little bit more about this genuinely random pattern. So the reason why people don't like to pick this pattern is because it looks like there are clusters in the data. It looks like there are places where someone has put the points closer together than they should be. We think of randomness as being well spaced. When I described the pattern, I said that with equal probability, I choose the x-coordinate from anywhere along here. And with equal probability, I choose it anywhere along the vertical axis. And that makes us think that there this dot should all be equally spaced out throughout the grid. And that's not the case with randomness. And in fact, not only are there clusters, but there are also big areas where there are no dots at all. There are big spaces. What the, the, the thing that I want to say about our understanding of randomness or spotting of randomness is that we are predisposed to pick out patterns where perhaps there aren't any. And so this might be apocryphal, but the story goes that back in the day when we were hunter-gatherers, we would be out in the forest hunting or gathering, and um, maybe we would hear a rustle in the bushes, or we'd see, uh, the, we'd see a pattern, strike pattern in the trees. 
and we would get scared and we would run away because it might have been a tiger, a predator coming to eat us. So we run away and we survive and we pass on our paranoid genes. Probably it was just the wind rustling the bushes or just the sunlight filtering through the trees making a striped pattern. But nevertheless, we survived and we pass on our paranoid genes to the next generation. We got good at spotting patterns, perhaps where there weren't any, and that allowed us to survive in the one or two instances where there was a genuine tiger waiting for us in the bushes. Um, so that's, that's uh, a bit about why we maybe spot patterns, but now we don't tend to use that for hunting or gathering, although we do sometimes use it in the context of food. Nowadays, we spot patterns where there aren't any when looking for Jesus in pieces of toast. And so this is a nice example. This is not toast, this is actually a tortilla. It's maybe not so obvious with this one, so I'll zoom in. There you go, now you can see it, hopefully. You can see that there is a beardy bloke in this tortilla. Now it could be me, but actually, the most famous beardy bloke in the world is probably Jesus. And so people say, oh, I've just seen Jesus in my piece of toast. It's a sign from God that I should be I mean, maybe eating less carbs or something. I don't know. Um, but anyway, so, so this is a phenomenon called pareidolia, which is where we interpret uh, an ambiguous auditory or visual stimulus as something which we are familiar with. We tend to pick out faces. And then we sometimes go a step further and say this is a sign from God. We draw some causative inference based on that pattern that we've seen. And this is a phenomenon called apophenia. So here's another example. This is a face. Uh, it's called the red face of Mars. Or it's not actually a face though, right? It's a bunch of craters and hillocks on Mars lit by a particular angle of the sun. So it looks like, it doesn't even look like a full face, right? It looks like half a face because the rest of it is in shadow. But we fill in the gaps. We're very good at doing that. So this is an example of apophenia. And again, we're good at recognising faces, which is why we see faces of the Virgin Mary or Jesus in a piece of toast or the man in the moon, because, um, again, uh, dubious evolutionary explanation upcoming, the idea was that it was very useful for us to be able to recognise faces, to read faces, to read people's emotions, so that we could quickly decide whether they were friend or foe, whether we wanted to run or fight or, or just say hi to that person. Um, so it was quite important for us to be able to recognise faces, and this is where this apophenia comes from. We draw these inferences based on these random, uh, random patterns, effectively. So another place where this happens is, uh, is in uh, the iPod shuffle. So uh, people in the audience may be too young to remember this now obsolete piece of technology, but this was a transformative piece of technology back in, I don't know, the early 2000s. Um, you could put all your music on here, 10,000 songs. This was in the day when you had to like accrue music by buying CDs with 10 songs at a time and you had to like burn them onto your, rip them or whatever the word was, onto your computer and then download them onto your iPod Shuffle. And what the iPod Shuffle would do was it would take all of your music collection and it would then play it back to you at random. So some people hated this, I hated it, but some people loved it because it meant they didn't just listen to the same old songs over and over again, they actually genuinely explored the whole of their music collection, which people liked. Now, there was a journalist called Stephen Levy, and he was listening to his iPod Shuffle one day, and a Bob Dylan song came on, came on and, and, he, um, and he enjoyed this Bob Dylan song, and immediately afterwards, another Bob Dylan song came on, and he freaked out about this. He was in the very fortunate position that he was a tech journalist, and actually he was due to interview Steve Jobs. So he went to Steve Jobs, who was then the CEO of Apple, who created the iPod Shuffle, and said, Steve, I think you've got a problem with the randomization in your iPod Shuffle, because I had one Bob Dylan song play directly after another one. And Steve Jobs was like, mm, that's probably sort of expected. Anyway, I'll get on the phone with an engineer. So he got an engineer on the phone, and he said, is, there, you know, is our algorithm genuinely uh, playing songs at random, picking them uniformly at random from amongst all the songs the engineer checked, and he said, yes, yes, it absolutely is. And he told Stephen Levy this, the journalist, and, the, and Stephen Levy didn't like it. So he went away and he, he wrote an article and said, well, this happened to me. And he got hundreds of responses with people saying, yeah, I had two Oasis songs play back to back, or I had three Manic Street Preacher, Preacher songs play back to back to back. That can't possibly be random. And so Steve Jobs, acting on this feedback, spoke to his engineers and said, please can you make it so that two songs from the same band do not play back to back to <laughs> shut these people up. And so they changed the algorithm in iPod Shuffle to better conform to our idea of what randomness is, even though that's not what genuine randomness is. Randomness has patterns in it, or at least the appearance of patterns, and it has clustering. Uh, so spacing it out is somehow, as Steve Jobs described it, making it less random to make it appear more random. So that's the iPod Shuffle. So as well as and not being good at spotting randomness, I'm going to argue that we're also not very good at being random 
for ourselves in this last bit, part of the talk. So in the next uh, slide, I need a volunteer. But before you volunteer, I'm going to tell you what you're volunteering for. It's always useful to know that. It's nothing embarrassing or, or you know, I'm not going to make a fool of anyone. Um, so I'm going to click on this link, which is on, from this picture. It's going to take us to a website called an Aronson Oracle. And basically what it's going to get us to do is to press two keys, the F and the D key, and to try, as it says there, to do it randomly or as randomly as you can. And then the computer is going to try and predict what key you're going to press next. And so to set your expectation for this, if you are genuinely able to hit the keys at random, then the computer shouldn't be able to guess what you're going to predict, what you're going to press next with an accuracy any higher than 50%. 50% is the best that it should be able to do out of these two choices. So now what I'm going to ask someone to do is to come up, and we're going to try and do it quite quickly because we want to get through maybe 100 key presses. Um, but I'm going to ask someone to come up and just press the F and D keys as randomly as you can. Does anyone fancy having a go at doing that? Yes, please, come up. What's your name, mate? Max. Max, great. Thank you, Max. Right, let me just click on the link. It should take us to the website. And then uh, just before you start, what, what's going to happen is there's going to be five or six key presses while the computer learns what Max is doing. Um, and then it's going to start outputting a prediction. A red line will mean it's got the prediction wrong, and white will mean it's got the prediction right. Uh, and then after about 25 key presses, it's going to start outputting its accuracy, so telling us how well or badly it's done. So it needs a bit of time to, to learn what Max's preferences are going to be. But um, yeah, that's what we're going to expect to see. There should be a number coming up. So Max, when, whenever you're ready, just you know, position your fingers on the F and the D keys and just be as random as you can. So yeah, go for it, please. Take it away. And as fast as you can, I think, as well, if we can, so we can get through. OK, so we're seeing some, some bad predictions, some good predictions, about 50, 51. So it's pretty good. So Max, you've been very random. You're going below 50%. That's very good. Keep going, keep going very hard to sustain below 50% for any <laughs> period of time, especially when someone's talking at you. Uh, you. So you can see that there are big periods of white. There's a few periods of red, but there are large. So we're going up to 60, oh, 70. Oh, oh, Max, it started so well. It started so well, nearly 70%. Brilliant. Thank you, Max. That's absolutely fantastic. Everyone give Max a round of applause, please. Thank you. <laughs> it's incredibly difficult to do. I usually... Um, a bottom out at around 70% as well, and I've been trying to be random. The thing is that about, ran about trying to be random is, again, we think of randomness as being sort of well-spaced. So in this context, that almost means alternating between F and D. We think that that's quite random. Of course, we know that that's not random because we know that that's a predictable pattern. So we throw in the occasional double D or double F or triple D or triple F if we're being adventurous. But actually, within in 100 key presses, you would expect to see five Ds in a row or five Fs in a row with a 95% probability. But we just, really, that feels unintuitive to us. That cluster of five Ds in a row doesn't feel very random. So very rarely, and I suspect if we looked back at what Max pressed, we would probably very rarely see five Ds. The flip side of that is sometimes people then overrepresent the five Ds and the five Fs, and they go for seven or eight Fs in a row and think that that's being random. And again, the, the idea is that we should be uh, yeah, trying to mix this up and genuinely choose random, and it's very, very difficult to do. All the computer's doing under that, it's no, no, no AI or anything, it's just literally um, keeping count of sets of five consecutive key presses and building a, a histogram of the frequency of how many times FFFFF, FFFFD, FFFFDD was pressed, and so on, for all the different 32 different combinations um, that could be pressed, and then looking at the previous four key presses, and then choosing which one the most likely one was from that histogram that it's built up. So it's not a complicated algorithm, but still, for me, it creeped me out a little bit the first time I did it that I wasn't able to be random. And I was like, well, maybe this brings into question my free will. I don't know enough about that anyway. But anyway, it felt a little bit weird. Um, so yeah, it, it feels a bit strange that people could be sort of exploiting our, our inability to be random. And actually, that's what I'm going to tell you about now, is how to exploit other people's inability to be random, briefly. So we're not very good at being random. We think of randomness as being evenly spaced. Um, we know that regular spacing isn't exactly what we should be doing, so we mix it up a little bit. And we also exhibit middle bias. These are the three things that we need to remember when we're thinking about how other people are being random. So um, what I want to tell you about to, to finish up is about the National Lottery in the UK. So the National Lottery started in 1994 in the UK. And towards the end of 1994, no one was winning the lottery. So actually, for two or three weeks in a row, no one won. And there was a build-up, a, a rollover, as it was called. Uh, so on the 14th of January 1995, the jackpot was about 17 or £16 million. Pounds. 
And so people thought, well, there are only 14 million different combinations, so maybe I can go out and buy all the tickets. Not a good idea, because of course, if you have to split the jackpot, you are completely screwed, right? Um, so, in fact, people were very excited about this draw, and 70 million tickets were sold in the UK. So some people were buying multiple tickets. That's how excited they were, because there aren't 70 million people in the UK. And so on that, on that day, uh, when the draw came around, uh, the numbers that came out were these, 7, 17, 23, 32, 38, and 42, um, which seems maybe like a random selection, I don't know. Um, and it, of course, was a random selection. The machine picked them genuinely at random. Um, with 70 million people playing and odds of 14 million to one, we would expect four, five, six people maybe to win the jackpot and share it together. Uh, so still getting a decent amount of money, two or three million pounds. What actually happened was that 133 people won the jackpot, which is sort of astonishing. And can you imagine that, thinking, I've won 17 million pounds, and then actually finding out you won 100,000 pounds. Absolutely devastating. So why was that then? Why did 133 people choose the same set of numbers? Well, let's have a look at the National Lottery play card. This is it. This is what it used to look like when the lottery was one pound to play, and there were 49 numbers, uh, and you got to choose six. This is a six from 49 lottery. This is what it looks like. There's five uh, numbers in each row, uh, and apart from the last row, there's four, and there are 10 rows. And so uh, on the 14th of January 1995, I'm going to show you where the numbers fell on this play sheet, and we'll see what it says about how random people are. So this is where the numbers fell. So first, straight away, you can see there's middle bias, right? They're not using the outer two columns. In fact, they're not even using the fourth column either. All the numbers are picked from two columns. They, the numbers are relatively well spaced. There's a gap, then a number, then a gap, then a number, then a number, then a gap, and, and then three numbers in a row. So it's relatively well spaced. They're just picking from these two columns. Um, so they're, they're trying to space things out, they're, you know, maybe a couple, in fact, there's four in one column and two in the other. So they've sort of gone down this column and then they've occasionally just deviated to the side. Lots of people were doing this. The other thing that really stymied this draw was the number seven. It's the world's favorite number. Loads of people choose number seven in their draw. So the, this idea that we think of randomness as well spaced, that we're subject to middle bias, and also the fact that there are no consecutive numbers in here is quite telling because we don't think of consecutive numbers as being random. But actually, in half of all draws with the 6 from 49 lottery, you would expect to see two consecutive numbers. But people don't like doing that. So maybe, uh, maybe I've just cherry-picked this example where 133 people won it. Uh, there's another example I want to show you. There. On the 16th of March 1996, 57 people shared the, the jackpot. And these were their numbers. And this is even more strong, an even more stronger an example of these phenomena. Middle bias, again, the outer two columns are not being used. Literally, they've gone number, space, number, number, space, number, space, number, space, number. They've used 28, 38, and 48. You can't get much more regular than that for a pattern of three numbers if you're trying to space it out. And again, they've not gone for consecutive numbers. Um, so the, the lessons are that if you want to keep the most of your winnings, then you should try to avoid numbers that other people are going to pick, right? So I can't tell you how to win the lottery because every set of numbers is equally <coughs> likely to come up. One, two, three, four, five, six is just as likely as any other set of numbers to come up. But what I can suggest is that if you do win, that you can keep most of your money. So here's the strategy, how to maximize your winnings. Um, firstly, you could try using a random number generator to generate your numbers rather than being subject to the biases that we're all subject to. If you use the National Lottery's lucky dip function, it just picks numbers at random for you. So actually, if you just play the, 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 the lottery, the expected winnings are 45p for every pound that you play. So you lose 55p. If you do this random number generation strategy, that goes up to a massive 55p. So it's not great, but it is better. So you're only losing 45p in the pound now. But actually, what a better strategy to do is to avoid using numbers that other people use. So pick unpopular numbers. How do you do that? Well, people use birthdays and anniversaries for their lottery picks. So avoid the numbers 1 to 12. Not completely avoid, but bias your selections away from the numbers 1 to 12, because that's the months, and 1 to 31, because that's the days in the month. People always use dates as their picks for, not always, but often use dates for their uh, lottery picks. Don't worry about putting consecutive numbers in. You might as well put consecutive numbers in because no one else is doing it. So put a few consecutive numbers in there because th every pick is just as likely as every other pick to come up. So just make sure you avoid um, 
picks that other people are picking, and then don't shy away from the edges of the playslip. Make sure that you use all of the playslip and you're, you're not subject to this middle bias. So here's a sort of sensible choice um, that I've picked out. And um, you know you might not like it, but I'm showing that there, I'm using the edges. I'm using I'm biasing myself away from those top 31 numbers. I've only chosen two of my six out of the first 31 numbers. I've got consecutive numbers in there, so I'm not saying this is any more likely to win than any other pick. But if it does win, uh, I'm fairly confident that not many other people will have chosen these numbers. Okay, so this seems like a sensible choice. So I'll finish by saying um, one of the main messages of the book is that coincidences can be surprisingly likely. Going back to um, you know, Jesus and a piece of toast. If you look at enough burnt tortillas, then eventually you're probably going to see something which looks a bit like a face. Uh, the idea that coincidences can, can surprise us, and we sometimes think, oh, that's spooky, that's exciting, that's an interesting coincidence, maybe there's something on, going on there. I don't want to ruin coincidences for people, but coincidences, even unlikely things, given enough opportunities, can be incredibly likely to happen. So, for example, with the lottery, it's incredibly unlikely for any one person playing with one ticket to win the national lottery. But given that lots and lots of people play the lottery, someone wins almost every week. Okay, so given enough opportunities, even extremely unlikely things can happen. Coincidences can be surprisingly likely. We are not very good at spotting randomness. We tend to pick out clusters and assume that there is meaning behind those clusters when maybe there isn't. And then finally, we're not very good at being random for ourselves. And so if you genuinely need to be random, then do try and divest your randomness to a genuine random number generator. Get a dice out, get a coin out, or go to a computer and generate randomness that way. And that's all I really wanted to say. So I'll finish by saying thank you very much for listening, and I'm more than happy to answer anyone's questions. Thanks very much.